campus devotional. I uh, was able to uh, preach this lesson a couple weeks ago to staff, and I want to give it to you guys tonight, okay? So I hope you're fired up. And the title of my lesson is Covenants. Covenants. So we're going to talk about God's covenants tonight. You know, uh, I got to do a Bible study with a young man uh, a couple weeks ago. And as I was going through the kingdom study, we get to the point in the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit comes down upon the men, the 120 men, right? Yes. And the fire comes down and lands like tongues of fire, and they speak in different languages, mm-hmm. right? Yes. And the sound of a blowing of a bottle of wind. I don't know what that sounded like, some screeching loud noise, right? And it reminded me of something. You know, it reminded me of when God came to Abram. And when God came to Abram and he sealed his covenant with Abram, and I realized that God was sealing his new covenant with his people. And it reminded me of of that in Romans 12. It reminded me of Mount Sinai when God gave the law, that God gave the law for us. You know, and there's actually seven covenants in the Bible, which we'll talk about tonight. Come on, bro. And uh, there's, there's seven different covenants, four of which God made with the nation of Israel, the Abrahamic, the Palestinian, the Mosaic, and the Davidic. Of these four, three are unconditional in nature. That is, regardless of Israel's obedience or disobedience, God would still fulfill these covenants with Israel, and we all said, Amen, Amen. right? Amen. Sometimes we need those uh, unconditional ones right there, right? Yes. And of the covenants, the Mosaic covenant is conditional in nature. That is, the covenant will bring either blessing or curse depending on Israel's obedi- obedience or disobedience. Three of the covenants, the Adams, Noah's, and the New Covenants, are made between God and mankind in general and are not limited to the nation of Israel. So the seven covenants, I'll go through them really quickly here for us tonight. You guys with me here? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So the first covenant is Adam's covenant, right? Which we see in Genesis. The next covenant is Abraham's covenant, which is in Genesis 12. We also have the Palestinian covenant. We have the Mosaic covenant, which we see in Deuteronomy 11. And we see David's covenant, which we see in 2 Samuel 7, verses 8 through 16. Come on, bro. We also see the new covenant. Let's go to Jeremiah 31. Come on, bro. See, all these covenants we can find actually in the Old Testament. And we see in Jeremiah 31 that God gives us a glimpse of what the new covenant would look like. And for me, when I read the new covenant, it gave me hope. And I hope it gives you hope tonight. Jeremiah 31. So this is written about 600 years prior to Jesus walking the earth. And and Jeremiah 31 and verse 34, just give me an amen when you get down there. You guys are quick. Verse 31, it says, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And with the house of Judah, it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand and I led them into Egypt because they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or or a man his brother say, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest. Isn't that awesome in God's kingdom? Is we can come in here and go, Hey, everyone knows about Jesus, right? See, back when you were an Israelite, you had to teach the Israelite children, they were coming up everything about what God had commanded. So that's awesome, right? Come on, bro. And he says, For I will forgive their wickedness. Mm. Yes. And remember their sins no more, which is awesome. So this is God alluding to this new covenant that we see here, right? The new covenant is distinguished from the older covenants in four different ways. Come on, bro. God will write their law on their minds and on the hearts of those in the new covenants. 
Second, God will be the gods of those in the new covenant, and they will be his people. Come on, bro. The third thing is that those in the new covenant will know gods. It's pretty awesome. You can say, I know gods. The fourth thing is God will forgive the iniquity. Come on, bro. Amen. Amen. And the sins of those in the new covenant. The new covenant, therefore, has two basic characteristics in which we're going to talk about tonight. And these two things, I really believe, can actually change our lives tonight. So let's talk about it, right? My first point is that God's covenant means you can get back up. Come on, bro. God's covenant means you can get back up. Let's go to Mark 14. Sometimes we just need to get back up. You know what I'm saying? I don't know how you're feeling tonight, Adivo. I feel hot. It's pretty hot in here, right? It's the fire. It's the fire in the room, right? But sometimes you just have one of those weeks you come in and you go, man, it's just awesome to be in God's kingdom, right? You get the refreshments. From being with God's kingdom. Let's go to Mark 14. In verse 22. Light it up. You know. We're going to look at Jesus. Probably one of the most intimate times he has with the disciples right here. In Mark 14 verse 22. It says while they were eating Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. And he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he offered it to them. And they all drank from it. This is my covenant, the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for the many. He said to them, I tell you the truth, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. You imagine the scene, it's late at night. Come on, bro. The disciples have just come back from a hard day's work in, in the life of Jesus, right? Yep. Running at Jesus' pace, I think, was probably pretty radical, right? Yeah. I mean, Jesus uh, worked pretty fast. Killing people, raising the dead. You know, they're going across the lake. The crowds are following them. They feed the 4,000. They feed the 5,000. I mean... It's a radical lifestyle. Come on, bro. They come in. They're tired. They're sweaty. Some success, some failure. I'm sure Peter got rebuked that day. Twice. 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 It was a rough day for Peter. Come on, Peter. They're eating euros with some tzatziki sauce. Eating bread, wine. And Jesus takes this moment to capture something that would stick in their minds forever. And he takes the bread and he institutes the new covenant. This is a huge moment in time right here. He institutes the new covenant and he says, remember me. Remember this moment. And he gets the disciples to remember the moment that they're in. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know about you, but some of the, my greatest memories as a child, or even in the kingdom of God, is, is eating food with some of the disciples. Yeah. Yeah. Just sitting around, and, you know, you go out for a late night uh, Bible study, and you get some, uh, you know, we go with Dion. Dion knows all the places to go eat all the food, oh, right? Yeah. Uh, we go, we, in Berkeley, we have this place. It's uh, Steve's Korean Barbecue, and they hook it up, right? Huge plate, tons of meat. It's awesome. And uh, he breaks the bread. He gives it to him. This is my body. You know, in Central Africa, there's cannibals that believe that they would gain the strength of those that they ate. And so this is really, in essence, what Jesus is doing. Hey, this is my body. This is my strength right here. Eat it. Become strong like me. He takes the wine, which is his blood. It's for the forgiveness of, of the sins of the disciples. And we know that they're derelicts, right? Yeah, come on. Bro. Amen. Amen. You know, and it reminded me of 1 Timothy 1, verse 14. And Paul says, The grace of the Lord was poured out on me abundantly. Yeah, all right. And I think about this. You know, if there was a measuring cup that could measure the amount of blood that it needed to forgive your sins, I mean, some of us might need 
buckets, I don't know, gallons of uh, this blood, right? Come on. So I might think, uh, you know, a little different of ourselves here. But Paul says, Paul says, hey, the, the amount of blood that I need, Jesus, he filled it all the way up, but you know what? Just in case, he poured a little bit over for me right there. And that's what we got to see. The new covenant gives us hope. Is that Jesus bled on the cross for us. Yeah. And he knew exactly how much Tyree would sin. Oh and it would be a time. Yeah. And then, then Jesus just, you know, he knew exactly what Tyree needed. And he poured out. Just, even, just, just pour it over. Let's overfill this cup for Tyree. And he overfilled it for us tonight. Yeah. And that's one thing that we got to grasp here tonight about the new covenants. Is that God has forgiven our sins. Yeah. And not only that, he's poured it out even more. Come on, he's given us even more than we need it. Wow. What does this mean? Thank you, Adrian. Let's give it up for Adrian. Yes. What does this mean? What does this new covenant mean? It means that we can get back up. Yeah. That's what it means. Do you feel knocked down? Do you feel knocked down this week? Yeah. Do you feel knocked down this month? Yeah. Maybe school was like just a punch to the face, right? <laughs> Maybe this year you feel like, man, life just kicked you in the face this year, right? Some people go, hey, man, it's been like that for years, bro. Yeah, bro. Not one year, years. Yeah, Maybe this decade has been like that for you. But you know what? We can get back up. And that's what it means. That's what the new covenant means. You know what this is called? This is called the resurrection principle. As disciples, we got to be experts at getting back up. Let's go to Psalm 20. Yeah. Psalm 20. It's lit, bro. You think about with Jesus himself. He takes on all the sin. All of our sin, right? All of Quaker's sin. Yes. Wow. All of Ashley's sin. All of Jason's sin. All of Janora's sin. All of Leo's sin. All of Lydia's sin. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah. All of my sin. You know what the scariest thing to Satan was? That Jesus got back up. Yeah. It's like a horror movie. It's like a horror movie. You ever watch a horror movie and they kill the guy and then he, he gets back up? Yeah. Right? That's Jesus Christ. And that's the scariest thing to Satan. But it's the greatest thing for us. Yeah. Is that no matter what's happened to us in our life that we can literally just get back up. Let's go to Psalm 20 and verse 6. Now it says, Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He answers him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. And so we get the opportunity to get back up. We get the opportunity today to rise back up. What does it say? What's the key difference between the wicked and the righteous? It says the wicked will fall. You know what it says about the righteous? They're going to fall too. Yeah. But what does it say about the righteous? That we're going to get back up. That we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna succeed. And so I don't know how you feel tonight. I don't know if you feel like you, you, know, you got punched in the face by Satan. He found that one weakness, that one thing. Maybe he gave it to a little anger this week. Maybe he gave it to lust or maybe some just laziness. You didn't share your faith. You come in here tonight, a diva, you go, man, like, how many souls did I walk by this week and didn't share my faith? And the blood is on our hands and on our head. But you know what? We can get back up. Yeah. yeah, think about it. Jesus took on all the sin of the world. All of your sin. Everyone's sin, and he still got back up. So for you and your sin, your few sins that you committed this week, you know what? You can still get back up like Jesus got back up. Amen? Let's go to Proverbs 24. 
Come on, bro. You know, actually, I'm sorry. Let's go to Philippians 3. That's good, too. This one's better. <laughs> Flip over to Philippians. You know, for me, uh, I've been knocked down a few times. And, uh, man, it's some, you know, as a disciple, man, you go through some stuff, dude. I tell you what, man, you come out of the water, you're fired up, you're happy, everything's good, you're in that, like, honeymoon period with Jesus. I remember having quiet times at the U of O campus, going on campus, praying, and I would go to this one uh, coffee shop, i get, like, my holla roll and a cup of coffee every morning, it was awesome. Have my quiet time, pray, you know, there's not a care in the world. And, uh, man, it, it shortly after, it, you realize, man, this is actually really tough. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one of the toughest times for me is going to New York City. And in New York City, uh, it was radical. We go to, you know, for me, I'm from Oregon, and I'm hanging out with, like, deer and, like, squirrels and stuff, right? <laughs> and I'm called, this guy, this white guy from Oregon is called to go to Harlem, right? In New York City. And it freaked me out. <laughs> and God did amazing things there in New York, but it was really tough for me. And I remember uh, a, a particular point in my life, and I think I've shared this before, but uh, I think it was like the perfect storm and everything hit me. Like everything. It was like, it was like a, a month period where everything went wrong that could go wrong. And uh, my leader got open about sin, and that he had been hiding sin, which was just, it was radical. It was uh, devastating for us. And, uh, you know, for me, I had been in sin. I got taken out of leadership. Uh, my wife's sister, she fell away. Uh, we had a miscarriage. Uh, all within, and then her grandma died. And it was just like back to back to back. Come on, bro. And it was so tough. And I remember... Um, I went with the only guy that couldn't cry to help me uh, mourn. Come on, boys. And uh, we pick on him a lot. But he really helped me a lot. And this time, we went to Harlem. And, uh, you know, I'm, in, I'm on 145th uh, on Sugar Hill crying on a fence uh, with Quaker. And I, like, drooped over this fence, like, just, like, realizing, like, what had happened. Come on, bro. You know? And uh, I had to make a decision at that moment. To get back up. Come yeah. on, bro. Come on, bro. And I had to get, I mean, I had to make a decision to fight. Come on, bro. You know, a lot of us are here tonight, and a lot of us have been knocked down, okay? Mm-hmm. And some of us are young Christians, maybe you're like, hey, dude, I don't even know what you're talking about, but guess what? You're going to know in a couple yeah. weeks, and you'll remember this lesson, take notes, and then you'll know what to do, okay? Amen? All right. I'm glad we've established this. But maybe you feel like you're knocked down, maybe you feel like you haven't reached your full potential. Or maybe you feel like you got a lot to grow in, but I tell you what, you got to make a decision. Yeah. And we can make a decision today because of the new covenants, because of the blood of Jesus. We can actually get back up Come on, bro. tonight. We can make that decision. It's the resurrection principle, yeah. right? We can have the same feeling, the same connection that we have with God at our baptism. Come you on, can bro. have that tonight. That's the great thing about being a disciple. Oh, yeah. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Is that we can get back up tonight. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen. The second thing is God's covenant means that God is with us. Wow. Let's go to Hebrews 11. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 11. You know, when I did get back up, I had, I had people to help me get back up. You just can't get back up by yourself. And I remember uh, Chris Adams helped me get back up. Carlos Mejia helped me get back up. Come on, bro. Ron Harding helped me get back up. And these guys got in my life and like literally breathed life into me. You know, and, and I was having a hard time connecting with the pain. And, and some of us, we go through, we go through pain and we go through pain in our life. And trust me, God will put pain in our life. But you're not connecting to it. Mm. And that pain is what drives you. It's what makes you great. And that's the thing I had to realize is that for me to be great, God had to put me through that stuff. Yeah, bro. yeah come on, bro. And some of us, we go, man, I don't want to feel pain. Mm, yeah. I don't want to embrace pain in my life. But I'm telling you, it's what's going to make you great. Yeah. The trials in your life are there by God to make you great. Sometimes you want to run from them. Yeah. Yeah. And I've done that. 
Before I went to New York City, I was in a bad situation too. I, I don't know, a bad situation just followed me. Maybe it's, it's all everyone else, not just me, right? No, it was me. And uh, I was in, I was in a, like a little tiny, there was a, a mission team that was supposed to go out. This is like way back in the day. But this this place called Corvallis, Oregon. And uh, I don't even know, if you, you guys don't even know where that's at. Oregon is above California, just in case you didn't know that. <laughs> right? So I was, I was picked, I was hand chosen by God to go to this place called Corvallis, Oregon. Yeah, right. It's the grass seed capital of the world. Okay, just in case. Grass, grass seed. You could actually, at Oregon State University, you can major in beef. Yeah. Yeah. And poultry. Like, this is where all the, the hicks and uh, the, you know, cowboys go. <laughs> And so I, I went to this mission team, and we had like a group of, uh, on this mission team, uh, I think probably maybe 10, 12 people, and they all started to kind of like fall off, and then it was left, and it was just like four of us on a mission team. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was uh, a brother and his, his wife, he just got married, it was me and Amanda, and we just got married, and that was the mission team, and we get up on stage, and it was like, oh wow, that's it, you know, <laughs> and we're sitting on this mission team. And to Corvallis, Oregon, and it was tough. It was a really tough time for me. And what the one thing I did wrong is uh, I didn't get back up. And I let the discouragement and the things happen, and I just I gave up and I ran. And I ran down to LA, and I was like, I want to be, you know, I want to do something great. So I'm gonna go to LA, and I go to LA, and I realized that the troubles just follow you wherever you go, right? And so when I went to New York City, you know, I made a decision that I wasn't gonna do what I did in Corvallis, and I wasn't gonna run again. Yeah, come on, bro. It's time for us. It's time for us to stop running. Yeah. Some of us just run from our problems. On, you go, oh, it's, this is hard here. Let me go to a different Bible talk. Oh, I need a different discipler. Oh, I need a different situation. Let me drop it out of this class because it's tough. That's not what disciples do. We're here to get back up. We got to persevere. We gotta face our problems. Yes, yeah. We gotta grab those things. Yeah. We gotta love them. We gotta eat problems for breakfast. Yeah. We gotta love our problems yeah. because it makes yeah. us strong. Come on, Popeye. You know, when I embraced my troubles, it changed me. I wasn't afraid anymore. You know, this is movie by Mel Gibson, and I forget what, what it's called. I'm blanking it right here. No, no, it's, it's the one where it's like all about fear, and it's like these, uh, these apocalypto. apocalypto. You guys see that? Yes. And they're running from these guys that are going to kill them, and they decide they're going to stop, and they're going to turn around and face their fears and fight. You know, that's us. That's us here tonight. Come on, bro. It's time for us to turn around and fight. Yeah. yeah, we got world problems. Okay, what's new? I don't think this isn't this isn't something new, right? We know that. We got school problems. For some of you, that's not new either. You act like, oh, oh, I don't know what happened. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I don't know why my, my grades are bad. Someone's got financial problems. I don't know what happened. Well, let's look through your bank account. Let's find out what happened. Man. We can fight these things. We can turn around and we can embrace the trials in our life. We can embrace the pain in our life. It will make us great. Amen. All right. My second point is. The new covenant means that God is with you. Hebrews 11, verse 32. So what does it mean that God is with us? What does this mean? It's so, it sounds so awesome, right? Oh, God is with me. What does that mean? Hebrews 11, verse 32. Let's see what, the, let's see what this looks like when God is with us. Nice. And what more shall I say? I do not even have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms and ministered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lion, who quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and became powerful in battle, 
who routed foreign armies. Women received back from the dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and floggings, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskin, goatskin, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And these were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them had received what was been promised. But God has planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Wow. That is flat awesome. Yeah. That's what it looks like when God is with you. Yeah. Does it mean all your problems went away? We just read a bunch of problems right here. Yeah. Saw it in two. Did you read that one? Yeah. <laughs> right? Stoned to death. Like, this, this, there's some real problems right here. But they faced their problems. They embraced the challenges in their life. Come on, bro. Because God was with them. And they did incredible things. Yeah. Let's go to Malachi 4. Yeah, bro. Right. So I want to talk about a guy who walked with Jesus. Who you could say was really Jesus' right-hand guy in the beginning. Let's go to Malachi 4. So... Here we have Malachi. It's the last book of the Old Testament here for 400 years of silence. And it says one thing. And then God just stops talking. It says one last thing. And I want us to hear this. Malachi 4 in verse 5. See, I will send you a prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. So the last words penned by the prophet here, Malachi, says that God would send Elijah. Yeah. You go, who's Elijah? Who is this awesome man, Elijah? Let's go to Matthew 16. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Let's see how awesome Elijah was. So when Jesus transfigures, right, which would probably would have been a pretty amazing sight right there, right? I don't even know what that, maybe he became translucent and sparkly, you know, and it floated, in the, you know, it's like glowing, like pretty amazing sight here, right? Yeah. Who's with Jesus? Let's go to Matthew 16, verse 13. I'm sorry, Luke, uh, no, I'm sorry, I got the wrong passage here. 17. 17, is it? Yeah, Thank you. Thank you, bro. There it is. Get it, bro. There it is. All right, verse 1. It says, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. They led him up to a high mountain by themselves. There he was, transfigured before him. His face was shown like the sun. His clothes became white as the light. Man, he got some fresh clothes on too, right? <laughs> Just then he appeared before Moses. And who? Elijah. Elijah. Wow. How awesome was Elijah when Jesus like transfigures and he's chilling in heaven, kind of like in this like you know weird, you know, just hanging out. Who's he with? Moses and dude Elijah, right? So to say that Elijah would come back was a pretty big deal. Yeah. All right, let's go over to Luke one. So here's a guy. We're really gonna look at Luke one. Who had a great calling? Luke 1 and verse 12. Just give me a name when you're there. Come on, bro. Let's just start in verse 11. It says, Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord, their gods, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and in the power of Elisha to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And the disobedience to the wisdom of the righteous. To make ready a people 
prepared for the Lord. So who was this Elijah? It was John the Baptist. Well, Johnny boy. Let's go to Matthew 11. Let's see what Jesus says about it. I'm going to feed it to you here in a second. It's all our time. So John's supposed to be the Elijah. That's pretty cool, right? I have to say, to, to have that kind of title right there, I mean, to be called a prophet of God, and, and to be called one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, it's pretty amazing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to Matthew 11. Excuse me, Donald. Amen. Those nuggets. Matthew 11, verse 1, it says, After Jesus had finished instructing the twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. You guys with me here? Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Amen. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples and asked him, are you the one who is to come, or should we just expect someone else? <laughs> Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out in the desert to see? Wow. A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No! I tell you, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Come on, bro. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Wow. come on, bro. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, bro. But we see here a guy, John the Baptist, wow. right? Man! Be pretty awesome. You're chosen by Jesus, chosen by God. Prophesied the last words penned in the Old Testament are about you. How would you feel about yourself? <laughs> pretty awesome, right? <laughs> Yet John never realized who he actually was. Let's go and find out. Let's go to John chapter 1. You know, a lot of us, we walk around... And we don't realize who we actually are. Yeah, come on. And I'm sharing this for us. I'm sharing this for me. Because sometimes I can forget that God has actually chosen me. And you go, hey, how could, how could you forget? You know, it, it, it's kind of crazy because you think about what did Satan do to Jesus? Well, he tempted him, right? As soon as he was baptized, first 40 days. And what did Satan say to Jesus? If you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. Then do this. Then change these rocks into uh, loaves of bread. And so this is what Satan comes after. He comes after our identity. Let's go to John 1. Verse 19. This was John's testimony. When the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confess really. I'm not the Christ. Amen. You got that right. Amen. Good job, John. And they asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Whoops. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sins. What do you say? About yourself, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling the desert, make the straight path for the Lord. See, we have John the Baptist, the right-hand man, the cousin of Jesus here, chosen by God, prophesied in the Old Testament, 
spoken about by Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. Jesus calls him the Elisha. How does John view himself? Come on, bro. How does John view himself? And a lot of us are here tonight. And you go, who am I? Come on, bro. And people try to speak life into us, right? They go, bro, you're going to do something awesome in your life. Sis, you're going to do incredible things. And we just don't believe it. We walk around not really fulfilling our calling and our destiny. Come on, bro. Any of us, any of us can be like John the Baptist. This is John the Baptist, the greatest man, the greatest man of the entire Old Testament, greater than Moses, greater than Abraham, greater than David himself. Come on, That's bro. what Jesus said. Yeah. And here's a guy that did not realize his full potential. Mm. Yeah. Do you think we can fall into the same trap? Yeah. Do you think some of us are here tonight that don't realize your full potential? Yeah. yeah. They don't realize what you can do for the city of San Francisco. Yeah. You don't realize what you can do in the South Bay on that campus. Come on. You don't realize what you can do here at SF State. Come on, my brother. You don't realize what you can do at Cal State East Bay. Wow. And we walk around not realizing God's calling for us. Come on, bro. In our life. Get it, bro. Let's go to Psalm 18. Come on, bro. Take it there, bro. Guys, it's time for us to embrace God's call for your life. And I hope, I hope you're kind of like w- woken up here tonight. Yeah, come on, bro. I hope this really gets your attention. I hope I have your attention tonight. Because I believe in this room is the foundation of a church that would be in the thousands. That's right, bro. Come on, bro. The tens of thousands. Yeah. That in this room that you're chosen by God to evangelize the world. Do you believe that? Come on, bro. And you go, oh yeah, I'm in the kingdom of God. I'm here to make disciples of all nations. But do you really believe that you can walk with God? Come on, bro. You know, one guy I want to lift up is Ole. Come on, Ole. And here's a guy that, man, as soon as this guy got baptized, like Satan was just shooting shots at this guy. He's driving his car, and, and, and he, he has a nice comfy place in Merced, which is basically uh, cow country out there, okay? <laughs> Cheap rent, all right? Very, very inexpensive out there. But he makes a decision that he wants to be a sold-out disciple, and the best place for him to be is to be around disciples, right? Yeah. And so he condenses his classes. He cuts out some of the classes he really wanted to take. He cuts it down to two days a week, and he, he travels out to Merced. Now he needs a car to drive this, you know, 108-mile journey every, you know, two, uh, twice a week. So he buys a car, right? And then he's driving it down to Merced, and the engine blows up. And then he finds out that his dad is sick. And then all these just thing after thing after thing, you know. And I, I said, bro, like, this is God making you great. This is awesome. And he's like, bro, this does not feel awesome. <laughs> if this is what awesome is, I don't want to be awesome. <laughs> and he made a decision to persevere. And he's like, bro, I'm on this campus. What do I do? I was like, well, uh, we can't really send any people out there because, man, it would just, it would just take all our resources out here. Bro, just preach the word there. Yeah. And so he goes, bro, yeah, I started preaching the word, and like, people want to come to a, you know, study the Bible. I was like, all right, cool. Like, all right. Then, all right. It's like, bro, just, just you go start a Bible talk by yourself. Just, do, just come to my Bible talk, hear what I do. You go out there and do the same thing on that campus. Oh, so he, is, he comes in, our, he drives all the way in. Tuesday, so he gets out of class, he drives three hours into Berkeley, and here's my Bible talk lesson, right? And he goes in there on Thursday, right? Day full of classes, and he starts his Bible talk. And he calls me, he's like, bro, like, people showed up. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> he's like, fired up. You ever led like your first Bible talk, and like, you're like, hey, people showed up? Amen! <laughs> And then he's like, man, 10 people came out. I'm like, you had 10 visitors at Bible Talk? That's amazing, bro. And then this last week, he had 16 visitors at Bible Talk. There's so many people at 
that Bible talk? He, I was like, bro, just go around. Like, as soon as Bible talk's over, just set up studies. And he's like, all right, bro, uh, I set up, like, seven studies for Wednesday. I was like, oh, okay. So I'm like, grab Adrian, we go all the way out. And Merced, I don't know if you've ever been to UC Merced, but literally you're driving like through normal, like, you know, uh, well, not really, it's Fresno, it's kind of the armpit of California. But we're driving through like uh, this area, and then you get to like, you get literally to just like a vast, uh, vast fields, like cornfields off to your left, cows off to your right, and you're like, is there like a, is, is my, my direction's got to be wrong here. And you're like, oh, and there's like a, this university in the middle of nothing. And uh, you like, the parking lot is gravel, right? I was like, yeah, do we get a horse to like travel onto campus here? Like, what is this place? And we go there and we sit down and we do seven studies. You know, the cool thing is that, you know, he's been, I've been coaching him through all the studies and on his travel, you know, it's three hours, he gets to pray, have a quiet time, and he listens to all the first principle lessons over and over and over again. He listens to Jason's lesson, listens to Kip's lessons, and this guy is just like equipping himself with the scriptures. And he calls me, he goes, hey bro, how do I lead this study? And so like, he, this, he's led all the way up to the kingdom study, just through like coaching and teaching and training. Because he believed one thing, that God is with him. Yeah. And then one guy by himself could have 16 visitors out at a Bible talk. Yeah. They could set up seven studies. I mean, we did it. And then we sat down with the first guy we sat down with. Leads, he's the president of three clubs at, at UC Merced. Three clubs. One's like the Society of Black Engineers. One's just the regular engineers. And then one is like some other one. I'm like, dang, this guy's intense. <laughs> Next guy is the president of another engineering club. Yeah. You know, and so this is us. Let's go to... Uh, uh, Psalm 18. Come on, bro. Yeah, bro. Psalm 18. Psalm 18 and verse 30. Let's look at a man who realized his full potential. So we can get some hope. Verse 30. As for God... His way is perfect. Come on, bro. The word of the Lord is flawless. Yeah. He's a shield for all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength. He makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You give me your shield of victory. And your right hand sustains me. You stoop down to make me great. You broaden my path beneath me so that my ankles do not turn. This is what David thought of himself. Yeah. How do you view yourself? Did you wake up and go, man, Christian, Enos, God's man. Chosen by God. Handpicked. Selected by God. Come on. Josh. Picked by God Almighty. On, bro. He trains my feet like the feet of a deer. <laughs> he enables me to stand on the heights and I'm so strong. I can bend a bow of bronze. Come on, bro. Is that how we view ourselves? Come on. This is how we gotta view ourselves, guys. Yeah. You know, for me, it, it was hard. I came from a situation where you know, I wasn't really successful in life. Kind of failed life many times. And people in my life just started to get with me and started to say, Dustin, you can do something great. Bro, you can do something great. God has chosen you. God has picked you. And hearing that for like, I seriously, probably eight years, I finally started to believe some of it. And I was like, dang, I, maybe I am chosen by God. Maybe God picked me, right? And it's time for us. It's time for us to believe that tonight. You know, another guy who, who believed his calling in a worldly way was Winston Churchill. You know, he became prime minister in 1940. He often said he would not call those dark days, but stern days. How stern were they? The German army had just overrun Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg was deeply driven, was uh, driving deeply into France. The small British uh, force was being cut off and reduced to a small pocket on the English Channel. 
And uh, historian John Lucas and many others say that this was Hitler's great opportunity. With Britain's troops stranded on the French coast, Hitler might have parachuted 10,000 commandos into the heart of London and taken the country by shock and awe. Still, Churchill did not say he was afraid. When he was finally selected at the age of 65 years old, that's pretty old, (laughs) to be prime minister, he achieved the ambition of a lifetime. And here's what he said about it. Thus then, on the night of 10th of May, at the outset of the mighty battle, I acquired the chief power of state. During these last crowded days of the political crisis, my pulse had not quickened at any moment. I took it all as it came. But I cannot conceal from the reader of this truthful account that as I went to bed about 3 a.m., I was conscious of a profound sense of relief. At last, I had the authority to give direction over the whole scene. And I felt, and I felt as if I were walking with destiny. And that all my past life had been but preparation for this hour and for this triumph. Ten years of political wilderness have freed me from the party antagonists. My warnings over the last six years have been so numerous, so detailed, and were so terribly vindicated that no one could gainsay me. I could not be reproached either for making the war or with want of preparation for it. I thought I knew a great deal about it all, and I was sure that I should not fail. Therefore, although impatient for the morning, I slept soundly and had no need for cheering dreams. Facts are better than dreams. So Churchill says he felt like he was walking with destiny. And that everything in his life was but preparation for the moment that he had in his life. He's 65 years old. Here's a man who knew his calling. Let's go to Hebrews 8. We'll close out here. Thank you. That was encouraging. Sometimes you need one of those. Keep awesomeness, bro. Thank you. Hebrews. Chapter 8. And so of the seven covenants, the days we live in today is the last covenant. Let's go to Hebrews 8, verse 5. Come on, bro. Yeah. They serve as a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But the ministry of Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one. And it was founded on better promises. Come on, bro. And that's true. That this new covenant that we get to experience, of the seven covenants, we live in the new covenants. Yeah. The, the new covenant, what does it mean for us? What does it mean for you tonight? What does it mean? It means that you can get back up tonight. Come on. You can get back up. You can face your trials. What is the thing that's just freaking you out? What is that thing that you just see me can't get by? What is that one thing? Write it down. And face it tonight. Come on. Come on. The blood of Jesus means that you can get back up. Yeah. That you can face the things in your life. Yeah. What else does it mean? It means that not only that, that all the sin, right? If you can just, you know, if you needed this much sin, the God would just overflow it right there, right? Mm-hmm. So if that's been taken care of, we're pretty good, right? Yeah. But not only that, that we have a great purpose in our life. And the purpose is to evangelize this world. Yeah. Is that we got to bring the kingdom to the world, and we got to bring it fast, obviously, because there's some problems in the world. Yeah. You know, it's sad. I mean, Shiloh's brother was just shot. Yeah. How fast do we have to evangelize this world? Wow. Some, pay, some people say we're moving too fast. Some people say, no, 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 just take it slow. You know, these leaders aren't trained enough. We got to just kind of slow it down right here. I say we got to speed it up. Come on. I say it's time to evangelize this world. It's time for us to raise up. God has called you. He's chosen you. He's equipped you. He's forgiven all your dereliction, right? Not only that, that he's going to walk with you. Yeah. And if you really, 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 really believe it, 
God can do incredible things in our life. And it's time for us, San Francisco. It's time for you to rise up tonight. It's time for you to embrace your calling. Don't be like John the Baptist. Don't be like all those who have failed in the past. Now, John was awesome, okay? But really embrace your calling. Embrace what God has called you to, and to God be the glory. Amen.